I'm Ken Rockwell. Let's look at my Canon EOS R3, but first let's take a look at some of the pictures I can make with this lens. This first shot, a sunset. This was shot in JPEG quality four. All these shots here are simply shot in JPEG. No raw, no fooling. This is shot with my EF 100 to 400 millimeter LIS2 on my EF to RF adapter set to 135 millimeters at F7.1 handheld at a 400th of a second at auto ISO 100. I also use Skylum Aurora HDR and Perfectly Clear software to pump it up a little bit from my single JPEG file. Here are crazy stairs. Shot in JPEG quality 4. Shot with my Canon EF 16 to 35 millimeter f4 LIS on my EF to RF adapter. This is at 16 millimeters wide open at f4 handheld at a 20th of a second at auto ISO 160. A red Buick. Shot in JPEG quality 4, shot with my ancient 1990s Canon EF 28 to 135mm IS. It was Canon's first IS lens. Sales used for about $100 if you look at my review and the links in my description. And it works awesome on the EF to RF adapter because the R3 has electronic compensation for anything that this lens doesn't do well. Corner fall off, sharpness, distortion, it's all corrected in the camera if you just activate the options which are usually on by default. This is shot at 90 millimeters at f6.3 at a 400th at auto ISO 100 with minus 7 tenths of a stop exposure compensation. Here's a Chevrolet. Shot with the same 28 to 135 EF lens at 105 millimeters at f6.3 at a 160th of a second at auto ISO 100. And this is as it was shot. No software fiddling. Just boom, right as it came out of the camera. Here's a 1946 Chevrolet Fleetline. This car looked awesome. It was three-dimensional in person. Shot again with my old plastic EF 28 to 135 millimeter IS on my EF to RF adapter. At 112 millimeters, it have 6.3 at a 1 160th of a second at auto ISO 100. And I used Skylum Aurora HDR from my single JPEG file to add some vignetting and make the Candy Apple Fleetline look three-dimensional which is what the vignetting will tend to do by boosting up the brightness in the middle. I love that software. Oh my gosh, here's a portrait. Here's my son Ryan, just made casually. He came home one day, needed a picture for school. This is with the R3, of course, JPEG quality 4, as are all these. The EF 100 to 400 millimeter ISL2 on my EF to RF adapter at 330 millimeters, wide open at f5.6, handheld at a 250th at auto ISO 320. I also use my Canon 580EX2 flash on the camera, which balanced just great in this lighting. The 580EX flash you can get for less than $100. It works flawlessly with the R3. Just pop it on. There's links to the review of that, as well as links to where to get it for cheap, right in that review in my description. Portrait lenses are not 85 millimeters. That was from back in the 40s when that's when all we had. You want to shoot portraits from about 15 feet away to get a natural rendition to the face. In other words, make them look like they actually look in person. If you get any closer, five feet away, it's starting to look a little more amateur. And heaven help us if you shoot it from handheld. <laughs> handheld selfies are two feet away, which the whole world tends to do today. But uh, that does not render people naturally. Here's a shot, simply a chandelier. This is just a demonstration of what this camera can do with old lenses. Here's again my 28 to 135 IS on my adapter at 105 millimeters wide open at 5.6, handheld at a 20th at ISO 2000, and it's sharp and looks just great. Here's another shot with my old 28 to 135. And why do I shoot with the 28 to 135? Well, because my 24 to 240 wasn't handy, my original RF lens. But this old 28 to 135 I love because it's small, it's compact, it covers a fantastic range. I much prefer it to my new 28 or 24 to 70 f2.8 lenses, which are just much heavier, and only go halfway. <laughs> they only go to 70, not 135. Any case, this here is shot at 28 millimeters wide open. At f3.5, handheld at 1 tenth at auto ISO 1 25th, and I added 7 tenths of a stop exposure compensation to keep the light image light. Not bad. Stabilization, handheld at a tenth so I can shoot it at ISO 125 even after sunset. Colors, this is in shade actually. This is in the, <laughs> the sun's coming from the other direction. This is backlit. This is JPEG quality 5, uh, it's the same as JPEG quality 4. This is also with the plastic 28 to 135 IS on an EF to RF adapter wide open at f4.5 at 41 millimeters at an 80th of a second at ISO 100 with regular old-fashioned auto white balance as all these shots are made with auto white balance. Here's an alley. 
Canon 28 to 135 IS at 28 millimeters at f8 at a 320th at auto ISO 100, minus 7 tenths of a stop exposure compensation. Here's a tagger tagging. 28 to 135 IS at 41 millimeters again at f8 at a 320th at auto ISO 100. And this is exactly as it came out of the camera. Okay, back to the camera. And I'll admit, this is a YouTube video review. This is for fun. If you really want the full, detailed, explicit review, which turns out if I hit print in my browser, it's like 131 pages, go to the link at kenrockwell.com, which is in my description, and will take you to my written review online where you can read everything in much more detail and it's kept more updated than I could update this video. But what makes this camera special? First off, it has mind-controlled autofocus. It has what Canon calls eye control, but actually you can't even see the sensors. There's this big fat eyepiece here, and you see that lighter area there? There's sensors in there that detect where your eye is looking. And so it's called eye control focus, but guess what? You don't have to think consciously about where to look to focus the camera. Wherever you're thinking, whatever you're doing, whatever your subject, we just naturally look where we're looking. It's just sort of way, it's the human condition. So I call it mind-controlled autofocus because wherever you're thinking, that's where the autofocus sensor will go. Canon invented this back in 1998 with the EOS 3, the 35 millimeter camera, which actually worked really well. The gotcha was back on the EOS 3, it only had 45 big fat autofocus sensors. So as you use the camera, it magically would pick the right sensor. And that was awesome. With this camera, it also picks the right sensor. But since there's about 7 zillion of them, and it's so precisely indicated through the finder with a little round circle showing you where it thinks your eye is looking, that's never exactly on. Now, I calibrated my camera to my eye. At least I did it once. Canon says you can do it some more to get it better. To be honest, it's never perfectly on wherever you're looking. So don't get too picky about that. But here's the other thing. I don't use that mode very often. I usually, in fact, I have one of these buttons set to turn eye control either on or off, on or off. I only use eye control in cases where I have a subject with a lot of depth of field that's needed. And most of the auto select modes select the p closest part of that subject. And that's usually the correct answer. But if I'm photographing something where I need a large depth of field and I want to focus in the middle of the field, that's when I use eye control. Because then I can just think about or look at the middle of the field, drops the sensor right there, which is even faster than selecting it manually. Here's the other cool thing. It has magical sensors. You see this AF on control here? You see how it's black and shiny? That's a thumbprint reader. When you zoom in, and I program this to zoom in, now my finger moves that. I can zoom in more here, and I'm not clicking this. In the old days, remember like in the 1970s, you used to click this? This took forever to get to go someplace. Now, we just slide our finger along this control, and whatever direction we're moving, it just goes. This alone makes the camera worth buying, because if you want to do something and get somewhere, boom, you can get to exactly where you want to, as opposed to taking forever clicking this stupid control. It works just as well for selecting things through the finder if you're trying to place autofocus areas. This control is also in the 1DX Mark III. It's only in Canon's latest professional cameras, which means the R3 and the EOS 1DX Mark III digital single lens reflex camera. The other thing that works great, I was really surprised. Usually when camera makers claim sensor shift improvement of stabilization, like one stop, two stops, three stops, eight stops, it's always been a lie. I'm astounded that this camera with my non-stabilized 50 millimeter EF STM lens and my 180 millimeter EF macro lens, as well as my 14 millimeter F2.8 lens, I got five to six full stops of improvement so I can hand hold it one second or even four seconds with the 50 millimeter lens and get sharp shots. I was really impressed. I've never seen that before. And it was uncanny because I was taking my shots and down at one second, I'm like, gee, these are all still sharp. Two seconds, gee, they're all still sharp. Four seconds, they're all still sharp. I was getting sharp shots with my 14 millimeter EF F2.8 lens. And even at eight seconds, I was getting sharp shots, at which point I gave up because I didn't want to stand around just holding my button, waiting for make eight second exposure. The important part is the built-in sensor shift stabilization works phenomenally well with fixed focal length lenses. I didn't try it with my 50 millimeter F1, which again, is something else unique to the Canon <laughs> line. Nobody else makes a full frame F1 lens and they made this back in the 1980s. And guess what? It works flawlessly on my EF to RF adapter. So by all means, buy new lenses if you want, but you don't have to when you go to Canon. Sony had no old lenses worthwhile and Nikon's old lenses, only half of them work on the FTZ adapter. So that's one of the reasons I prefer my Canon. What else is new about my R3? 
Well, the flash works with the electronic shutter at a 1 180th of a second sync, which is relatively unusual. Very few cameras can shoot flash with the electronic shutter because most cameras have a severe rolling shutter effect with the electronic shutters. It makes flash use impossible. This doesn't have any rolling shutter effect that I've been able to see. In other words, if you're shooting stuff and going strong left to right shots, vertical lines will start to bend on most electronic shutters. Not on this. Kind of like the Sony A9, which also does a superb job. Sync is a 250th with electronic first curtain or 1 200th with the regular mechanical shutter. Another new feature is, is you can delete bursts. If you hit play and hit erase, there's a new option. In Japanese, it says erase scene including image. What that means is erase the whole burst. And I took a dozen pictures or so here. You'll notice it won't erase the locked or protected images. There we go, those are erased. What you can do then is you can shoot bursts when you're shooting sports at 30 frames a second, go through playback, you can hit the protect button, you know, program that, that's in my user's guide. And the user's guide, I have a link to that in my description. And by doing that, you can shoot long bursts at 30 frames per second in playback, select your favorites, protect them, and then delete the burst using that command. And this way, out of thousands of pictures, if you shoot a game or something, you may just have a couple of dozen that you really like, and those are the ones left on your card. There's a new auto white balance white priority option, which if you're shooting under tungsten will render everything very neutrally and won't be nice and warm and cozy like the traditional auto white balance. That's a choice you can have. It goes up to a 64 thousandth of a second top electronic shutter speed. So you can shoot this F1 lens in broad daylight quite easily. The electronic shutter also runs down to 30 seconds. This is also Canon's highest resolution professional camera ever. The 1DX Mark III is only 20 megapixels, and a lot of the other cameras that you may think are professional, like the 5DSR, no, those are consumer cameras. They don't have the vertical grip, and they don't have the voice recorder. You notice there's a microphone there? You can program this to be a one-touch voice recorder. So you just hold that, and you can record your notes, which is really important for news and sports, which is the whole point of this camera. This is a new sports action camera. You're out there shooting things that move fast, and then when you get a shot, you probably want to leave a note to your editor or yourself of what was in the shot or why the shot was important or how to spell the guy's name or something like that, and you can do that with the voice notes. The Finder, of course, is excellent. You don't need me to tell you that. It's got 5.76 mega dots at 120 frames per second. The Finder's great. Finder does not black out when you're shooting at 30 frames per second. What it does is kind of as Sony first did, is it just puts a white rectangle around the frame to let you know that something happened. Autofocus is rated down to light value negative 7.5, which, again, there's a link to what light values are in my description, which is three times darker than full moonlight. I, I never even bothered to test that. My other Canon cameras, even my EOS RP, can focus in near complete darkness just fine so I didn't worry about that. If you're shooting out in total blackness, probably doing astronomy, so good luck. For normal things worth photographing, any of the Canon EOS R cameras have been just swell. It's also got a new vehicle tracking autofocus mode. The older Canon cameras all have eye recognition autofocus and some of the newer ones have had animal for photographing, well, you know, pets or whatever, lions and tigers, dogs, as well as people. New mode now is a vehicle tracking to lock onto cars, motorcycles, planes, bicycles, and all that. There's a new shoe design. Actually, this is a weather sealing, supposedly, little thing, and they sell an adapter for your flash. I don't think you need it. I use my regular existing flashes. They work great. There's a whole bunch of new connections in here now, so you can get a direct digital connection for audio if you want to plug a microphone here or whatnot. But guess what? I think that's silly, microphone on a camera. If you're serious, like this video, I'm shooting this video you're watching right now on my iPhone, but I'm recording the audio with a phantom-powered large diaphragm condenser microphone plugged into a secondary recorder, in other words, a second system recorder, and I sync it all together in my video editing software. So if you're serious, I'm not that serious, and I'm using a second system. If you're serious, you're not really using a microphone on the camera or the built-in microphone. Just as a caveat, although my iPhone has a stereo microphone built in for recording video, this big fancy camera only has a mono microphone for video. So if recording kids' birthday parties using just your R3, which is really not the right use of an R3, then the audio is only mono. But even Canon makes, and lots of other people make, slide in stereo mics if you so like. I don't waste this camera on video. I think it's silly to use for video. I'd use a real video camera as opposed to a $6,000 pro high-speed sports camera. But clips will now run as long as six hours, not a foolish little 30-minute clip. And in the high speed modes, it can run an hour and a half per take rather than the seven and a half minute limit of the R5. What's bad is, as well as new, is that the serial number is now printed on a sticker on the bottom of the camera, like this is a disposable kid's toy. That's not right. On the 1DX Mark III, it's engraved into the very living metal. This, however, is simply printed. And I don't know how long that is going to hold up with daily professional use like that. We will see. But on the other hand, you know, if you forget your serial number, it's actually recorded in the EXIF data of every single one of your photos. So that's not that much of a concern. 
What's good about this camera, in addition to everything else I've covered, it just blazes away silently at 30 frames per second with no lags or hiccups or waiting for buffers to clear or anything like that. It's not like some of my Sonys where there's this idiotic progress bar in a finder while it's writing to the card. And then some of its functions are kind of half not working right, like playback, until it finishes writing on its own time to the card. No. This camera just does it. I can shoot away at 30 frames per second, then I can play back and see what I got, and it just never gets in my way. There's an idea in my head. I want to fix it in a tangible form. The camera should not get in my way, and this doesn't get in my way. And when I say 30 frames per second, I mean 30 frames per second. That's with full auto exposure for each frame, auto ISO setting, full lens corrections, in other words, if you want to correct for distortion or whatnot, as well as tracking autofocus, and even if you want to shoot at some ridiculously high ISO, like uh, 204,000, it, it just does it. And I'm really impressed at that. You can get color histograms while shooting. Other brands don't do that. But here, if I, can I show this here on the info screen? Yeah. Color histograms while I'm shooting. You see that there? That's a live color histogram. You can't get that in other brands of cameras. What you wind up getting is you can get it on playback, but while shooting, it's only black and white histogram. Here's the thing. Unless you're shooting black and white pictures, you notice how the red histogram has more exposure than the other ones? The red channel blows out first. So if I was looking at the grayscale histogram, I'd only see the equivalent of green, and I would clip off my reds, and it'd be bad time. So that's important if you're actually <laughs> careful about what you shoot. The battery has fantastic life. I can get close to, or even more than, 20,000 frames per battery. If I'm just motoring away... Actually, there's no motors involved anymore. Hey, it's 2022. If I'm shooting at 30 frames per second, then just shooting, just... Bzzz, bzzz, and mind you, I'm making those sounds up like a stage comedian. It doesn't actually make any sound at 30 frames per second. I can get the equivalent of about 20,000 frames per charge. I've never run it down that far because I've just never shot that much before I charged the battery. You'll see here, if you look at the percentage of the battery charge that I used and how many frames I made, simple algebra points out, I get over 20,000 shots per this charge. Now, of course, if you're a consumer and make a shot... Then look at it, zoom it in, think about it, change the menu things, make another single shot. Well, then you're not going to get anywhere near that number of exposures. It's more or less you get a certain number of hours of operation, and you can spend that hours of operation shooting at 30 frames per second, or you can take only one frame every hour and a half while playing with the camera. You're going to get about the same number of hours, so if you want to get the most shots, just shoot. Don't play. What's nifty is, is it charges via P power delivery USB-C. And that's awesome. And I will cover that in my user's guide, some of the options and other great things. But it pretty much charges from anything that's USB-C, as well as the old-fashioned 1990s style take the battery out charger. If you want to do it this way, I don't think you would. I don't think you'd need more than one battery a day unless you're really crazy. But if you do shoot more than one battery, then having an external charger is nice because when you get back at the end of the day, you can charge one in the camera and one or two in the charger, and you're all good. What's good is... The remaining shots indicator is smart enough that when you're shooting at higher ISOs, it tells you have fewer shots left because it turns out when you're doing JPEG shots, the shots that are noisier take more data, so you get fewer shots on the card. This takes the same battery and charger as the 1DX Mark II and the 1DX Mark III. It is C1, C2, and C3, which I find are critical because these modes, you can set them as you want. I set this for, for all the settings I use for my outdoor daylight shots. I use this setting for everything else, and I use this setting for sports. And to get this camera to run at 30 frames per second, you have to use the electronic shutter and do all sorts of other things, like turn off flicker reduction. But I don't turn off flicker reduction for my other shots because I want that. So each of these things, unlike Nikon or any of the other cameras, controls everything about the camera, even the LCD brightness. Notice, I use C2 for general shots, and I use C1 for outdoor shots. I set the LCD brightness super bright. So it just does that for me every time I need to shoot a different kind of subject. That's one of the reasons I love my Canons more than any other brand. It has what's called the bulb timer. Although the shutter speeds only go to 30 seconds, if I want to make a three-minute exposure, I can program the bulb timer, put the camera in the bulb mode, and then when I hit go in bulb, it'll time out three minutes so I can go out and have a sandwich or whatnot. And if I want to make exposures as long as 100 hours, I can program any time I want in hours, minutes, and seconds. I would prefer that it just simply let me get down and go from 30 seconds, 40 seconds, 50 seconds, a minute, you know, so forth and so on. But that's what it does. So it's a little more difficult to get the longer exposures. It's more clicks. However, you can set to the second exactly what you want, which I don't need. But if you do, that's what you got. You can save and load the settings to a card. That's fairly standard today for pro cameras. Honestly, the silent shutter is silent, but even the mechanical shutter doesn't make much noise compared to a DSLR. There's no mirror. It's just the shutter. The shutter blades are fairly quiet even by itself. What I do like is, is you can program this to go either way. When I turn off the camera, 
The shutter stays closed to keep the schmutz off of my sensor. It's got a built-in GPS, so just like your iPhone, you can tag your photos. And the built-in GPS seems to work pretty well. And because it's got a big fat battery, you can leave it set to the mode one, which lets the GPS always work when the camera's off. So therefore, when you just turn your camera on and start to shoot, it knows where it is and doesn't take two minutes to figure out where it woke up. But that is a nice feature. Built-in GPS. You don't need an app. You don't need a phone or external module to do that. It is Bluetooth. Also, Canon makes quality products. It's made in Japan. It's not offshore to some third world or communist country like so many makers of the consumer cameras do. What's bad? Well, there's very few bad things other than the fact that it's big, it's heavy, and expensive. But I did have one instance, that sunset shot I showed you at the beginning. It didn't want to focus on the extremely bright parts of the sunset. I don't know if that was just bad luck one day or I was doing something wrong or it has a problem shooting into the sun. <laughs> Maybe that's just a hint to the wise thing. Don't point me at the sun. It did not focus that well for that. And also the finder is big, bright, sharp, clear, fluid, and live. But the problem is in daylight, it can get so bright that it does tend to overemphasize your exposure. In other words, you may think you have an overexposed image either on playback or just looking live through the finder, which could tend to cause you to offset your exposure and make underexposed images which is not really a problem so long as you know that and you pay attention because everyone should always be familiar with their camera and be familiar with what it does. And so you experiment, see what it does in different conditions and just compensate accordingly. Photography has been like that for nearly 200 years. What's missing? Well, the stabilization performance with stabilized EF lenses wasn't all that astounding. It, it seemed like it almost worked better with my unstabilized lenses. I don't know what was up with that. And obviously, every lens will be different. There's no built-in flash, but big cameras haven't had built-in flashes. There's no automatic brightness control for this rear LCD. I really love my EOS 5DSR digital single lens reflex, which is 50 megapixels, has an automatic brightness control for this. So I can be shooting under moonlight or sunlight or indoors. It automatically adjusts and just takes one less step for me. What's funny is, is they went halfway. Every telephone I've had since the 1980s has had all of its buttons illuminated so I can use it in the dark, which, you know, you use the phone in the dark, use the camera in the dark. The only buttons that are illuminated at night are these three and these two. All of this other stuff is not illuminated. Now, with experience, we usually can feel these. These all feel different. They have different textures, different curvatures, different elevations. So we usually can figure it out. And again, if you shoot every day for a living, which is the whole point of owning this camera and what the guys who own this <laughs> do with it, uh, you should be able to figure it out. But one of my pet peeves is these should all light up. I mean, every cell phone has done that now for I don't know how long. And that's even cell phones back when we had buttons like Blackberries and so forth. If you want to get into the specifics of performance, and again, look at my written review if you want to get even more specifics. Autofocus is marvelous. It's just as marvelous as the R5. It works just great. There's no problem with that. I covered the mind control autofocus. That works great. Manual focus has all the usual magnifiers and peaking options. Auto ISO has all of the usual options for setting the lowest shutter speed, the highest and lowest ISOs. And you can even have the slowest shutter speed automatically select itself by focal length and shift it from that. There's no news to that. Just like all EOS R cameras, if you use the new FV exposure mode, which I usually do and I love, oddly, that tends to be at odds with and doesn't always follow the slowest shutter speed indications you might have in the auto lowest shutter speed mode. But I don't know. That's a specific thing that I happen to notice. <laughs> Not everybody does that. The color and tone rendition matches all of my other Canon digital, which I love. For crop modes, I actually program that to one of my function buttons. And it has all the usual 4x3, 16x9, square, 1 6. That's an APS-C crop as well as full frame. Ergonomics, the only weird thing is, is this has relatively straight lines on it. It's not really as ergonomic as some other DSLRs. My Nikon F6 is probably the world standard for what feels good in the hand, just like my Nikon D3s. This looks more like it's designed a little bit for looks. This material, it's not leatherette imprinted. It's just hexagonal dots imprinted. It grips the same. It grips well, but it does feel a bit hard, which is a bit harder feeling than some of my other Canon cameras. The menu system in the Canons is the best in the business, and the buttons do feel good. The buttons are all differently shaped, so I can pick them out by feel. And as I said at the top, this fingerprint sensor, oh, I love it. The finder, as I said at the top, it's bright, it's sharp, it's clear, and auto brightness control works well, but it will tend to err on being too bright in full sunlight, so be careful. Flash works great, as we expect with Canon, no news here. Remember that you won't get 30 frames per second if you're using flash. The fastest I got with my old 580 EX2 at the top sync speed of 1 180th with the electronic shutter is 24 frames per second, and I couldn't get it beyond that, and that's probably about right. Again, in my usage section, 
check my description for the links. I'll give you all the settings you need to go to 30 frames per second. For high ISOs, as we expect, high ISOs look great. Here first are full frame, complete images made at the various ISOs. And again, go to my written review at KenRockwell.com and you can download the original files and peep at them to your heart's content. As we go to higher ISOs, it really looks the same. Cameras never used to be able to do this, but this is standard today, which I love because it's the way cameras should work. Only at the very, very highest ISOs, the first thing you'll start to see wrong is there's a little bit of color modeling, which isn't that bad. And even at the very, very highest ridiculous ISO of 204,800, which is coded as H, which you have to enable in a menu, otherwise it won't go there, you'll notice that the blacks really are gone. The dark areas have turned to more light, well, the, dark area, the black areas have turned to dark gray rather than black. The real difference in ISO is if you zoom in way, 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 way too far. These are about 10 times magnification images. These are about 600 pixels wide by 450 pixels tall. Now, ISO 50 is a pull ISO, so the highlight contrast is a little more. You'll notice that you lose a little bit more in the reflection of the clock of my window, but it also is sharper. If you want the cleanest, sharpest images, I shoot at ISO 50 and just make sure I don't lose my highlights. Otherwise, everything else looks great. As you go to higher ISOs, just like every digital camera, just like our eyes, more noise reduction is applied, and you start to lose detail in the finer details. If you look at the clock face, look at all the squiggly lines between the numbers, you'll notice the squiggly lines simply go away. And of course, at the highest ISO, there's not much left to the image. That's as we expect. One of the other telling things is if we look at the shadows, the ISO 50 image is loaded with brilliant details in the shadow. And as soon as we go to ISO 100, if you look at the screen, you'll notice it starts to lose detail, even at ISO 100. And at every increasing ISO, we lose more and more detail. The screen starts to go away. We actually wind up losing the lines between the bricks and the back of this grill. And at the very highest ISOs, you can't even see the <laughs> you can't even see the big iron grate scrolls because there's really nothing left in the shadows at ISO 204,000. For lens corrections, it has all the standard things that we've come to take for granted in the other ESR cameras, which is fall off, distortion, and a digital lens optimizer which collects for chromatic aberrations and such forth and so on. Mechanics, while this is a tough camera by digital standards, it's not as tough. I think, as the 1DX Mark III, although Canon claimed it was. Because most of the top cover's metal. This is plastic. All the doors are plastic. Every button, every dial, every knob, every switch, every lever is plastic. The hot shoe, the metal part of the hot shoe is metal. This is metal. Tripod is metal. Although this surround, this surround is plastic. This grip underneath is plastic. This key here is plastic. Which, you know, again, it's a digital camera. You're going to throw this away in a couple of years. But it's certainly not built like, like a tank like in olden days when everything was metal. The top LCD is fine. It's visible in any light. If you tap this, you can get two alternate displays. And if you hold this, it'll illuminate very feebly. It's a very feeble illumination. I can't see it in the dark. But I thought that these top LCDs were a throwback to the days of 35 millimeter film when you didn't have a space on the back to put a screen. So this is just an extra. What's nice is the clock accuracy. You can set the clock to set itself by GPS. So this is probably no longer needed. But honestly, when I shoot multiple cameras, which is usually this camera and my iPhone, and sort everything by time shot, I like to have the clocks matching because if one of them is off by two minutes, then you really aren't getting the same view for each scene from each camera sorted by time. This is extremely accurate. It's only fast by less than two seconds per month or about 64 milliseconds a day, which is excellent. But that's my sample. Believe it or not, the clock accuracy is an analog adjustment of the quartz crystal that runs this thing. So every sample will be different. If we compare it to the R5, now this is a shot. I made this shot in my studio. This is actually the two cameras together. Quite simply, these are very different cameras. Neither one's better than the other. It's a matter of what are you going to do with it. The US R3 is designed for sports and action and for people who live by their camera every single day. 
If you spend all your time shooting, you want the R3. The R5 is much smaller and lighter. It does have higher resolution on paper, but to be honest, you're never going to see that. That's more of a sales feature than an actual thing you will ever see in a photograph. So I wouldn't worry about that. The R5 weighs less. 20 frames per second is not shabby. I have no problem shooting the same things with my R5. The real thing is that the R5 does not have the magic thumb controllers that just let you move around everything. It does not have eye-controlled or mind-controlled autofocus. Both of these do have voice recorders. The real choice to make is if you're going to earn your living with it every single day and carry it and shoot it all day, every day, by all means, get the R3 because it's got more stuff that makes life a little easier and you don't really mind the weight compared to everything else you're carrying. On the other hand, if I'm going for a backpack, I'm going to grab the R5. If I'm going to go shoot off in Yosemite for a week, I'll grab the R5 just because it weighs less if I have to carry it more and hike with it more than I'm actually shooting with it. But if I'm shooting a game, I'm going to grab the R3. For other things, grab the R5. Versus the 1DX Mark III, which is the world's greatest DSLR, DSLRs and mirrorless cameras are night and day different. Whichever one you prefer depends on what you're trying to do. What's different is, is I find the DSLRs, the response to all the controls is more immediate. It just sets a little more quickly than a mirrorless camera. However, although the 1DX Mark III works great at 16 frames per second for shooting sports in action, it tracks everything really well, because you're watching everything through a flipping mirror in your optical finder, it's blacking out 16 times a second, and because the mirror is flipping around so much, the image is smeared vertically as you hold the camera horizontally, and it sounds like it's going to explode. It sounds like a smooth controlled explosion, because it's, <laughs> it's just a lot of things moving around. So I would suggest if you're shooting for sports in action, I really do like my R3. I will admit it. I think it's a better camera because it's quiet and it shoots at 30 frames per second without giving you a hard time about it. Versus the Sony A1, the A1's only a consumer camera. It, it doesn't have a full grip on it. It's just a little camera. The main thing is that the Sony A1 has horrendously poor ergonomics. It does not feel good in your hand. You see all those dials? They all have square edges on them. Everything has got square edges. It might look okay. It does not feel good in your hand. It hurts your hand. It hurts my hand. It hurts everybody's hand. It's also dumped to Thailand for production. It's not quality made domestically in Japan like every other Canon camera that I've spoken about here. I also prefer the color I get from my Canons and Nikons compared to Sony. If you're shooting with the mechanical shutter, the A1's mechanical shutter only goes to 10 frames versus 12 frames per second, but that's not a big deal. The real difference is you're buying into a different system. I prefer the Canon system. I prefer Canon support. The menu system of Canon is something everybody can operate and works great, as opposed to Sony, which is a horrendously poor menu system. That means when you're trying to shoot something, something's going to lock up on you. You're going to go looking for it in the menu system, but by the time you finally find your menu option to get the camera to shoot, you will have missed your shot. So I'm not a fan of the Sony, but again, it's a very personal choice. The Sony, I believe, also costs more. It has more pixels, but as I covered before, pixels don't mean anything. The difference between 45 megapixels and 24 megapixels is a volume reading, like square footage on a house. The actual linear number of pixels per inch or pixels per foot or pixels per millimeter when you actually print this is only 37% difference between 45 and 24 megapixels. And guess what? You can't see that. That is such a subtle difference, it essentially doesn't exist. You need about a doubling of linear resolution or four times difference in area resolution to make a visible difference. And guess what? Because of pixel dumping, follow the link in my description, even a 4K display that I doubt any of you have on your computer, even a 4K display has only got eight megapixels displayed. No matter how many pixels you shoot, most pixels are simply thrown away before you or I ever see them. And the camera makers don't want you to know that because they want to sell you cameras based on pixels. But that's the real deal. Versus the Nikon Z9, the specs are all very similar. The resolution is different, but I said that doesn't matter. You're buying into a different system. I find Canon has a much more intelligent line of lenses. I know as a customer of both of these guys since the 1970s that Canon has better technical support. If you call 1-800-OK-CANON, OK you're going to get your answer. Nikon used to be good back in the 80s, but today Nikon doesn't really seem to like its customers very much. It's difficult to get support. Very little of what I own actually works on the Z9. The FTZ adapter doesn't work with most of my lenses. It doesn't autofocus with most of my lenses. It doesn't properly couple diaphragms with a lot of my lenses. It's just a, we well, can't say that on TV here, but the FTZ adapter really only brings across maybe half of the Nikon lenses. Now, if the only lenses you have are brand new AFS lenses for your digital single lens reflex cameras, you're okay. But if you're like me, who has been shooting Nikon since the 80s. The most of what I have doesn't work with my Z9, but everything I own since 1987 that's autofocus on Canon 
everything I can and it works flawlessly. So that's more of a choice. Now, again, follow my link to Sony versus Nikon versus Canon full frame where I give you a knockdown drag out comparison of everything that goes on with these cameras. I love my R3. There's no reason not to love it except for the fact that it's not free. It's difficult to get now as I make this video in February of 2022. Actually, people pay $2,000 more for them used over eBay than they do brand new. To get this camera, do what I did. I simply placed my order online, in this case from B&H, and I just waited till it showed up. Don't expect for it ever to show up as in stock anytime soon because it's that popular. What happens is you place your order from any of the guys I use, and the links are in my description. You place your order, and as soon as it comes in, they ship it out to you. Guess what? It never gets marked as in stock because as soon as things come in, the very same day, they're out to you, whoever ordered them the earliest, and out they go. If you wait for them to show in stock, you're going to wait for months until they're actually sitting around, but that's not going to happen. In other words, these cameras come and go every single day from these stores, but they don't ever turn on the in-stock flag because they don't have enough extra. They just sit around and wait for orders to come in because there's a long waiting list. So order it. Be patient. Otherwise, if you didn't order it in advance, then you're going to have to overpay at eBay for used one. Now, that'll change. As I said, as the months roll on, when you watch this next year, the year later, then it'll all be standard stuff, and you know, then used ones will be selling for cheap, but that's not today. Thank you very much for watching KenRockwell.com here on KenRockwell.tv. For all the details, please see my website, KenRockwell.com. To get this stuff, the biggest help to me is when you use the links I provide on my website or in my description. That's what keeps me on the air. And I appreciate you watching. Thanks again for watching Ken Rockwell and KenRockwell.com.